Welcome, right. welcome to our panel. So let me start uh, formally our discussion. Uh, I would like to first say good afternoon, good morning, good evening, as the case may be for our global audience who is connecting with this conference and this panel uh, from different parts of the world. A very well, warm welcome to the panel with the title Future of Full Employment Towards a New Social Contract. I am Adita Berar, currently engaged in academia and policy think tanks. I have a long and intense experience in the United Nations system, in development policies, in international cooperation. I have led the ILO's employment policy department and have advised many uh, countries uh, on their national employment policies, facilitated public dialogue, social dialogue on this issue, led various international negotiations on the subject of full and decent employment, formed multi-stakeholder partnership, notably in 2016, launching the Global Initiative on Decent Jobs for Youth. I am also, uh, just a few months ago, before the COVID-19 uh, crisis struck, we uh, launched a global uh, network of policy research on youth transition together for, with some 30 universities from across the global north and the global south. So I have, it will be a great pleasure to moderate this session. I am joined by four distinguished panelists with different and multiple experience and perspectives on the topic. Professor Randall Ray, Professor of Economics at the Bard College, previously at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, one of the developers of the modern monetary theory and a longtime senior scholar at the Levy Economics Institute. Professor Ray is the author of numerous books. Uh, Mr. Henk van Arkel, CEO of Social Trade Organization, Netherlands. Um, Social Trade Organization is one of the few research and development efforts focusing on improving money as a tool to organize society. He has led the development of e-payment software and award winning innovation, uh, which has in contributing, and he will explain to us, I guess, to reduce poverty reduction, uh, to reduce poverty. And presently the initiator of a cooperation of European regions focused on multiplying the impact of expenditure to boost small, medium enterprises. Uh, our third panelist, Mr. Chandra Sekaran, senior project manager at the Mother Service Society, a social science research institute in India. He is a chartered accountant by background, a research analyst in particular on self-employment, and especially he is an internet entrepreneur. Gary Jacobs, whom I don't think that I have to <laughs> introduce to you, he is the organizer behind the entire conference in his capacity as the president and CEO of the World Academy of Arts and Science, American social theorist, business consultant, author, chair of the board and CEO of the World University Consortium, member of the Club of Rome and vice president of the Mother Service Society. A warm welcome to each and everyone. Let me explain how we will proceed. We have planned an interactive and dynamic exchange and to get started, I'll take a few minutes to set the present global uh, context on full employment, on the social order or disorder. Then proceed by putting three to four rounds of questions to our panelists. This should take us a good 45, 50 minutes. And then I will open the floor for questions and comments from the audience. We will try to reflect with the panel on as many questions as possible. Although the schedule is set for one hour, we all have agreed, uh, thanks to Gary's suggestion, to stay longer. So stay tuned, ask your questions. You don't have to wait until we finished the rounds of panel discussion to put your questions and comments, but you can do that as the panel proceeds. 
For this, you will have to press the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, write your question and enter, and there it goes. Please identify yourself when putting your question. So let's get started on the substance of our discussion. We know how important is work for individual fulfillment, for economic and social performance and cohesion. It's not only a means to a livelihood, but a source of dignity, purposefulness, having a rightful place in the society. We are having this discussion at a time of sudden and massive job and income losses, mounting socioeconomic anxiety as a result of COVID-19 and the protective lockdown measures that had to be taken to prevent a collapse of health systems and to contain the pandemic. However, the situation pre-COVID-19 was also a situation of a global jobs crisis. And we have been in this situation for some time. No matter which indicator you look at, it points to a protracted crisis of full employment across regions. We are especially in the global north focusing on the levels and rates of unemployment. Pre-COVID uh, crisis, this unemployment stood at some 190 million uh, workers. Post-COVID, the estimates that are regularly updated upwards, unfortunately, show that the equivalent of three and a half million full-time jobs have been already lost. Now, more significant than unemployment indicator are the indicators of quality of jobs. 62% of the global workforce is working or earning their livelihoods in conditions mm -hmm. of informality, which means no or limited access to protections, to skills training, to development resources that are available to a formal work and business relation. Particularly affected by the pandemic crisis, as we have seen, is the lack of possibility for informal workers to comply with the lockdown measures while earning their livelihoods. The working poor, those who have a job but live in poverty, is a staggering 700 million across the world. And we are unfortunately expecting that poverty levels will rise. Now, the crisis is of full and productive employment is particularly affecting youth. Since the 2008-9 economic crisis and financial crisis, we have seen the staggering crisis of youth employment. We have, on average, over 40 million new entrants every year to the labor market. And youth are having increasing difficulty, including the highly educated amongst them, in accessing stable jobs, good jobs, or jobs where they can uh, project themselves into the future. Many are resorting to informal jobs, and some 260 million young people, again, globally, are in this category uh, of neither in employment nor in education and training. Gender equality gap, whichever indicator you, you uh, take, is st stagnating. And very significantly, in the last 25 years, we have seen a steady decline in the labor share of national income relative to that of capital, below pro productivity uh, growth trends. So what does it show? It shows that the gains of globalized economy have been unfairly distributed, contributing to one of the most glaring situation of inequality that we are witnessing. In the last couple of years, the debate on full employment has moved to look at Industry 4.0, technological innovations, and what does it imply for work, for the nature of work, and for the future of work? What do digitalization, robotics, artificial intelligence, blockchain technology imply in different contexts, advanced, emerging, developing countries, if this categorization still makes sense for full and productive employment. 
we have also seen that the increase in insecurities, the questions have been raised. Are these technologies harnessed to promote a better and more inclusive future? Or are, we, they, are they going to contribute increasing the insecurities, polarizing further the labor markets, polarizing further the social, and we have signs of both directions. Last but not least, the environmental degradation, how the transition to a greener economy is managed, will affect, is affecting the quantity and quality of jobs. Now, in some mainstream economic policies of the last two decades, have neither delivered on full employment nor on distribution of wealth and social cohesion. And while local realities that we, each of us lives in our protracted full decent employment crisis take different shapes in our individual and collective experiences, it has affected all economies and all societies. Now, especially with this COVID-19 crisis, the inequalities are led there, vulnerabilities in the, are exposed in the most visible ways. We have pictures every day of groups of population hardly hit by the impact of COVID-19. And as we speak, social protest movements have taken to streets in various parts of the world, across regions. But maybe th this is also a moment for optimism. At the same time that all the prognosis suggest that we are heading towards the worst economic recession in a century, we are seeing many of the ideas that were pushed aside by the neoliberal agenda emerging to the surface with increasing political buy-in and support. For instance, the idea of the, on the role of the state in steering economic investment and incentives. Various stimuli packages are announced, governments are injecting or have announced injecting unprecedented levels of support to prevent the worst scenario for both an economic and social collapse to prevent the talk of new deals, going back to the famous new deal, including green new deals, the need for universal social protection systems, access to health, but also access to unemployment insurance and other contingencies of life. Universal basic income has come to the fore and actually it's on the agenda of the parliament and policy making in Spain, revaluing the care economy, the care work, predominantly carried out by women. These were all ideas that have been around for, for several years, but now they are coming at the center of policy discussion. So we can legitimately ask, and this is what we are going to discuss in the panel, are we leaving a moment of change and acceleration towards a new and better social contract? how we will look at COVID-19 crisis in a year's time, a break or an acceleration of the paradigm shift. And also, we are now focusing in this panel on the social economic security, insecurity and human security, having had the previous panels focusing on the security in the more traditional sense of it. So, we have a vast menu of issues and ideas to discuss with our panelists. And I am sure that they will bring to this debate their very specific uh, vantage point and experience. So let me start by a question, uh, first question, and I'm asking all our panelists to, to reflect on that. In this challenging context that I have just scratch the surface. How do you look at the objective of full employment? As a fundamental right, I like to recall that the right to work is enshrined in the International Covenant on Economic, Cultural and Social Rights, which as you know is part of the Bill of Human Rights. Article 6 talks about right to work. That the ILO Convention 122 on Employment Policy ratified in 1964 uh, adopted in 1964, ratified nowadays 
by more than 100 countries, makes it an obligation for governments in consultation with short social partners to declare an employment policy to make every effort necessary to promote full productive and freely chosen employment? Or is it an aspirational goal? And some may add an elusive goal. Goal eight of the 2030 SDG agenda is about economic growth, full employment and decent work. Or should it become, become again, I would say, a primary political and policy priority which should guide economic strategies. If we just recall the post-World War II architecture of global governance uh, for economic and financial policies, they all assigned a priority to the question of full employment as much as financial and economic performance and stability. The Bretton Woods Institution, for example, uh, but this objective has become a secondary one or has been lost as, as of mid 70s into the previous decades. So I would like to start this conversation and this first question with Professor Randa Ray. Your latest book published in January 2020 is actually titled very purposely, A Great Leap Forward, Heterodox Economic Policy for the 21st Century. What's your view on this? Hi. Okay. Well, yes, I uh, agree, obviously, that um, a job for all who want to work, a paid job for all who want to work, is um, one of the recognized uh, human rights. And it underlies many of the other listed uh, human rights. Uh, without a job, uh, many of those are not attainable in uh, this system that we call capitalism. So in, uh, under a capitalist uh, system, and of course there are many varieties of capitalism, but this is a general statement. Uh, we do expect that um, paid work is uh, the basis for the livelihoods for most people. And <clears throat> unfortunately, for the past 50 years in this neoliberal regime that we've been living under in most of the uh, rich countries, um, the idea that uh, we must avoid true full employment, that we must keep a portion of the population unemployed as a way to prevent inflation pressures, uh, naturally leads to violation of this recognized human right. So we've been using unemployment as a policy tool rather than as a policy problem. And I, that is why even in the so-called best of times that we had pre-pandemic in the United States, we still probably had about 12 million people uh, without a full-time job who wanted a full-time job. Uh, the, um, uh, some of those have part-time jobs. Some of them are uh, putting together uh, several part-time jobs trying to make ends meet. And then many of them are officially unemployed or a greater number are unofficially unemployed. They're classified as out of the labor force. So what we've seen in the United States is that for prime age males, the labor, which uh, is age 25 to 54, uh, you would normally expect that these would have very high labor force participation rates. Traditionally, they have. In the United States, uh, their rates have been falling since uh, the early 1970s. So they're dropping out of the labor force. They're giving up hope of finding decent uh, jobs. <clears throat> so, yes, uh, we need to pursue full employment. <clears throat> And <clears throat> it should be um, true full employment, not some uh, fairly arbitrarily chosen unemployment measure, the so-called NIRU of 6%. Uh, there should be more jobs available than there are people who want to fill those jobs. 
that's the <clears throat> classical uh, beverage definition of um, full employment. We could say tight full employment is a situation in which employers would hire more workers if they could just find them. And today, th this sounds so radical that you want to keep labor markets so tight that employers are actually having to search really hard to find more employees uh, would be, you know, something undesirable. But uh, if we go back 50, 60 years ago, that was the common view of most economists, that it should be difficult to find enough workers. Um, and that opens up lots of possibilities for workers. It, it means that, you know, they, uh, they can um, search for jobs that are appropriate to their skills, appropriate to uh, the kind of work that they want to do. Uh, <clears throat> they will have some bargaining power so that they can try to increase uh, wages and working conditions, which in the U.S., of course, have been pretty stagnant since 1970 for most workers and even falling in the past 30 years for a huge proportion of the uh, workforce. So uh, lots of, uh, there are lots of good results of keeping labor markets that tight. I, maybe I, I should stop yeah, there. Yeah, let, let, let us uh, discuss uh, uh, later your ideas on how this can be um, reversed, if I may say, or how can we bring back the objective. But let me, go to um, Hank uh, um, and ask him what his take is on this notion and concept of uh, full employment. Yes. Um, full employment means that there are enough people with money who pay the stuff that is being produced. So if people have too little money to buy the stuff that is produced, there will be no full employment. Now, what we saw in the, yeah, in the last uh, 50 years, 40 years, we saw that the money was concentrating and that shouldn't be influenced too much, but it was also, uh, since computers uh, created more benefits, more profits uh, in speculation than in productive uh, activities, the money uh, went to the uh, speculative sector and uh, was not enough there was not enough money to buy all the productive uh, stuff so people started to borrow and uh, the interest rate got lower 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 but in the end you cannot fill a gap with borrowing so in 2008 that flopped uh, governments tried to step in the in the place uh, central banks stepped in the place okay so we have a central problem that if so much money is going to speculation and all and even more money to 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 counter speculation because that's even more expensive um we have a problem what we could do is use the money better in the end let's say you have the quantity the volume of money and you have the speed of circulation so what we are working on for example is a project um with remittances all the migrant workers, poor regions, uh, let's say approximately 500 million, uh, billion uh, US terms, billion uh, dollars. If that would circulate three times more, we would have 200,000, uh, 200 million additional jobs. So um, that's why we focus on how to make money move faster and move, move more often in an environment. And uh, to that end, we create specific uh, payment systems that uh, keep the money inside the community for a certain period of time. So I'm more uh, on the part of, of, of solutions, of course, than yeah, because let, we do we research and development. So, so that, uh, research and development means that, yeah, you, you don't analyze a, a problem to analyze it. You uh, yeah, but you analyze an, it to solve it. Yes, you raise an important issue and we'll come back to you to on the solutions. You raise an important issue of how much investment and and financial resources no, have been going. Sorry, I, no, no, I was not talking uh, about investment. I was talking about purchasing power. People yeah. who buy the stuff that, that is being produced. And uh, that has to do uh, because 
if I earn a lot, I can spend a lot. If I earn few, I can spend few. So there is a, a relation in uh, the circulation of money as in the, in the Fisher equation uh, has already been uh, okay. analyzed. Let us now move to, um, to Chandra Sekara. And uh, Chandra, in the world of self-employment, you've been working a lot, what does full employment represent? The notion of full employment. Uh, before the outbreak of pandemic, I thought it may be possible to achieve full employment in the distant future. After the outbreak of COVID-19, our social behavior and the way we work have changed. We are all willingly or unwillingly being co becoming comfortable with digital workplace and digital social culture. In the challenging times, I feel it is certainly possible to achieve full employment in the near future. I don't think it is an elusive aspiration. I believe it is inevitable. The reason behind my belief is the speed with which the world have adopted technology in pandemic times. Making people aware of the opportunities available on the internet and other digital technologies must be the priority of any policy maker. People must be educated about the benefits of self-employment opportunities, uh, the opportunities offer, and they must believe that these are real. Unless people are willing to acquire new skills and work happily in a digitally transformed world, declaring uh, employment as fundamental right will pose a challenge to achieving the aspiration of full employment. Any policy on full employment must include some important initiatives priorities like many jobs are being lost or being modified mostly in less digitally intensive sectors. Many new jobs are being created in digitally intensive sectors. So we have to change the mindset of people with respect to the change in their existing jobs and prepare them for new types of jobs or self-employment opportunities. Thank Questions you. about yeah. We, we will come back to, to those, the entire notion of digital um, economy and, and how this can boost or uh, jobs and what type of jobs. But let's, let me go quickly to Gary and have his perspective on this notion of the uh, full employment, decent work, and how we should be addressing it. Well, as it the first, let me... First, let me thank you for your analysis of the situation, which was so beautifully comprehensive and deep. Uh, my answer to your question is quite simple. Uh, I think that full employment in the, is absolutely essential. It's, it must be considered as a right. It is certainly an aspirational goal but I would also argue that it is essential for social stability, democracy, and, and social cohesion in the future. And we simply cannot go on uh, with the present situation where more and more people are alienated and lose the sense of security, which was the basis for the growth of democracy and, uh, and viable democratic societies. I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, you know, I look at uh, the right to employment as the economic equivalent of the right to vote in democracy. As, I, as, as one of, I think maybe it was Randall, I forget who said it now, but I very much agreed. Without, uh, without access to a remunerative employment, freedom is meaningless. In a society where each person or family is responsible for themselves, if you can't get food, if you can't get housing and clothing, what's the sense of talking about you're a free person and you can do anything you want? And it's also noteworthy uh, that in the US, during a period of its maximum growth, labor was scarce. Labor was paid far more than it was in Europe. We simply could not get enough people to do the work. And the economy was booming as a result. And that was the incentive for people uh, to, uh, to acquire higher skills and education and, and grow the society. It's also interesting, you mentioned the right to work. Uh, in 
1942, uh, President Roosevelt had a plan in place that the moment World War II is over, he wanted to introduce a second Bill of Rights, an ec a bill economic rights, and the first of those rights was the right to employment. So I'm arguing on two sides. One, it's absolutely necessary to either have full employment or, and or, and I think there is an and to this, other complementary ways to ensure uh, economic security. You mentioned the universal income, basic income and everything. So I don't think it's an either or, but one way or another through some combination, uh, it's absolutely essential for social stability for the future of society. And we see the results of it going in the other direction. The other thing I'd like to say, and I'm going to be brief because I know we have a lot more to cover, is that I think that the decision, the commitment to full employment is the single most important thing we need to do in order to achieve it. To simply leave it up to the market, we're never going to achieve it. Uh, but if we decide and recognize it as a human right, just like we finally decided after centuries that slavery has to be abolished or that women have equal rights or that children have rights uh, or uh, so many other things. It's the right that precedes the achievement, not vice versa. And I think it's a perverse argument to say we cannot guarantee the right because we cannot do it. And my final comment, which I probably will come back to is, uh, is to argue that we can do it. We have the capacity to do it. And if you look at it this way, that all, you, all the hundreds of millions of people who are unemployed today are, and I don't like the analogy, but it's a wasted resource. We, we have people who have needs that aren't being met, and yet we have people who are not being utilized. This is not an efficient economic system. And if neoliberalism says we aim for maximizing efficiency, this is a terribly inefficient system. It's wasting the most valuable, precious resource we have on Earth, which is the human beings, and it's also destroying the planet at the same time. So this argument of efficiency is utter nonsense when we look at it in terms of society. The benefit to society is maximizing welfare and well-being. That's what an economy is for, not for the efficiency or growth according to GDP. And this system is highly inefficient, and I think we have to recognize that and start with that premise. And, and Gary, thank you very much to show the connection between the socioeconomic uh, security and the political uh, democracy uh, and, and uh, how uh, failure on um, meeting the demands, uh, what has been pictured some years back uh, as a social debt is in fact also leading to um, various uh, manifestations of political dismay and um, uh, populist or isolationist uh, drives. So um, that also what Professor Ray uh, mentioned, using unemployment as a means of adjustment, in fact, um, uh, for the global economy. Uh, there has been a heated debate uh, what what helps promoting employment uh, uh, should this be a target of macroeconomic strategies should we focus uh, we be focusing on sectoral investment and strategies industrial policy should we be looking at education and sk skills development many have said that the deficiencies in full employment is because of the skills mismatch. Um, and whose role, how the various actors, the state, uh, national, local, uh, government structures, private sector, uh, big corporations, global supply chains, uh, SMEs, communities, institutions of labor market, but broader institutions of participatory democracy, what do they all have to bring to bear in this objective of full employment? And at this juncture, uh, I'm coming to you, um, 
Professor Ray, you were to single out a particular area where action would be most needed and most effective, uh, what would be that line of thinking? Please unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, I, lost, I lost Zoom for a while. Anyway. Shall I repeat I, the question or no? You, I basically I, I got, ask what, what can be done, no? <laughs> I think we are losing you, the connection. No, but you're back. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the basic proposal we have is for a job guarantee program. It uh, would be similar to some of the New Deal jobs programs, such as the WPA, uh, updated uh, to meet our current needs. The idea is that the national government will guarantee a job to anyone who wants to work and uh, will pay a decent wage. Our proposal now for $15 which is consistent with the move to a new United States uh, federal minimum wage of $15 an hour uh, by 2022. Um, and uh, the difference from the Rooseveltian New Deal uh, programs would be that our proposal is for universal, so it takes anyone uh, where they are, as they are, provides them with a job, that allows them to de develop skills while they work. Um, the administration of the program would be decentralized, unlike the uh, WPA and so on, which were all federally administered. Uh, we would allow all not-for-profit uh, community groups, state and local governments, school districts, park districts, uh, perhaps workers' co-ops, uh, would all uh, have the jobs federally funded. So the wages, uh, reasonably good benefits, and some of the materials and administration costs would be covered by the federal government, but the programs would be created locally where people need the jobs and where communities need the kinds of services that the workers would provide. Unlike the WPA, these mostly would not be huge construction projects. They, they would mostly be service sector jobs, public services, community services, environmental services, child services, elder care services, and in the era of the pandemic, health care services, uh, because that's what we need. We're a service sector economy. Uh, the majority of our workers already are in the service sector. Do you do you hear us? We we were we lost you for a second. Um, let me get back to you. Um, Professor Randall, I think we got what the gist of your proposal. Uh, it sounded like a revised, revisited, uh, um, massive new deal that we and I was going to ask you if you see the government uh, spending, investing on this new deal. It will be a new deal um, steered by um, the state. Uh, how do you see the private sector participating? You're with us. Please unmute yourself. I think I'm not sure. Uh, well, it may be better if you turn off your video. Uh, we may be able to maintain the audio better then. And you'll have to unmute yourself, Dr. Ray. Please try now. Okay, maybe 
while we are waiting for Professor Ray to reconnect because he's connecting from a different difficult location. Um, uh, let us let me. You're you're with us. Oh my goodness! Did you hear my 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 question prompted by your answer? I was asking whether you see this as a massive New Deal revisited, of course, uh, decentralized. Uh, but still with a massive investment by the state. But how do you bring the private sector? I, I turned off my video to see if the connection will be better. We hear you well. Can you hear me? Yes. I don't know if the connection is, is good enough. It is good enough. We hear you well. Okay. We, we see the federal government is providing the funding. And uh, if the federal government identifies, let's say, regions of the country, counties of the country that are not, not uh, up to the task of providing jobs for everyone, then the federal government would step in <clears throat> and provide jobs to those areas. Otherwise, we decentralize the program and let the local communities identify what needs to be done in their communities and let them organize the projects. Right. Um, and let me now go um, to, in the same order, to uh, basically Hank um, and Arkel, how your solution uh, is going to contribute what would you at this juncture how this could be scaled up or what do you propose um so uh, we we work on a uh, research and development program so uh, what we propose we already had piloted and tested and it works so uh, what it what can be done due to new technology is to label money uh, so to make it work for certain objectives for a certain period of time. Uh, this means that uh, the expenditures in a certain community or in, uh, to a certain objective uh, can circulate far more often. Uh, where money circulates far more often, uh, it creates more jobs and more income at both sides. It would not be all this the type of uh, the type of uh, use of the money that we now do because presently the money is basically concentrated around a lot of use of energy raw materials etc while if we talk about uh, enriching the community we are talking basically about services we are talking about let's say you go twice a week to the restaurant instead of flying uh, on a holiday to whatever you know, so it, it will be a change of preferences, but it's uh, possible nowadays to make money work more for the community. And the point is that at this moment, I, uh, um, I talked about that earlier before, that uh, we have accepted that too much money goes, is concentrating and is um, getting out of the community to the financial world. And the way uh, to counter that is to, uh, to, to use technology to make money stay for a certain while. Afterwards, it can go to wherever it wants, but first it has to do the objectives, uh, has to f fulfill the objectives the community gives it. So- Have you tried it in a concrete case? Uh, do you yeah. have it very- Yeah, yeah, of course. Exactly. Uh, so, um, for example, uh, in one of the pilots, uh, the multiplier of money is six to 12 times, which normally in a community is two times, three times, which means that um, in, in practice, if you see the, the SMEs that are engaged, they earn as an average 25, 30,000 euro. So let's say, uh, okay, euro uh, more per year, each year. So uh, earning more means that they can employ people. Uh, earning more means that they can spend more. So it, 
uh, it is a circ the circulation of money that is being improved. And that's why now with the pandemic, uh, big um, regions and, and cities like Barcelona or uh, Normandy, uh, that they choose to uh, multiply the impact of their uh, expenditures. They say, okay, this is a good idea. We use this technology to increase the circulation, to make it uh, the circulation more often, increasing the jobs, increasing income uh, in the community. Okay, let me move uh, to uh, to Chan Mr. Chandra Sekaran, and uh, you are a, in your initial introduction uh, showed that you are a great fan of. Uh, digitalization and you think that this is really a, a big opportunity uh, for self-employment. Uh, but do you think that self-employment on digital platforms uh, is the way of future? Is it available to all MSMEs, uh, micro, small, medium enterprises, for instance, uh, taking the, the example of India, how many of them are not digitally connected? And um, also the question of the quality of jobs, because there have been several studies that show the insecurity and the low wages uh, and lack of bargaining power or voice by those who are engaging, whether labeled as self-employed or as workers in the digital platforms. What will be the way this digital technology can be better harnessed? Internet and uh, related technologies have not yet reached many areas of work, at least in India. Uh, employing internet creatively can create tens of thousands of jobs. You asked about small uh, and uh, uh, small scale industries. I, I would like to take uh, agriculture, for example. Agriculture employs around 50% of Indian workforce, but the contribution of agriculture to economy is going down year after year. So the adoption of the internet in marketing agricultural products can solve problems of tens of thousands of small farmers. While solving the problems of small farmers, it can generate many new jobs for educated young youths. This has not yet been tried in this area. What government and other institution can do is to build infrastructure in rural areas. They can provide at least uninterrupted supply of electricity and the internet connectivity. If they can do that, these individuals can uh, create their own prosperity. Thank you. Uh, well, there are examples of financial inclusion through use of digital economy, but access to services. But also we have to be um, mindful that we need, a, a, first of all, to close the digital gap. Not everybody is connected, can access. And secondly, the, the conditions of, uh, of uh, uh, work of uh, having a business on internet, the accountability, uh, let alone the whole discussion around uh, uh, cybersecurity or privacy issues that have emerged. So, but I would like to um, ask uh, Gary, how do you see um, the, the initial change or the, um, this, an approach or an intervention that will make a dent into this protracted crisis that can be a beginning of a new social contract. I'd like to, thank you, Azita. I'd like to answer it in two ways. Randall, if you could mute, that would be, thank you. Yes, please, all panelists, when not speaking, mute yourselves. That will I think I'd like to address the big picture and then come to a specific, uh, because I think the specifics alone don't add up to a full explanation. 
if we want to understand why we don't have full, under, in full employment now, I think we have to go back to the points that you raised in the beginning, look at solutions there. We can't avoid challenging the current economic and financial system and expect to get the full results that, that an economy should give us. Uh, globalization, financialization, neoliberalism, the neglect of the environment are really the causes of the unemployment that we have today. Uh, and so if we really want to address it, we need to look at all of the all of the ways, and I didn't even mention education, which I suppose will, I hope will come to. Uh, but just to illustrate, today, the world has more than 150, $200 trillion in global financial assets, and yet less than 20% of it is going into the real economy, is producing real goods and services, is creating jobs. And that's because of the incentive structure, which incentivizes the use of money for speculation rather than the use of money for what it was originally founded for. And this is Hank's point, is to circulate in a community to build up the wealth of the community. Uh, and he argues very powerfully that the present system drains all the money out of the local community where people are living and takes it into global financial markets for speculation. So I don't think there's an ultimate answer that neglects changing things fundamentally, uh, changing the incentives for speculation versus the incentives for real investment changes. And there are many ways to do this, which I won't go into, but it's the, the methods are known. Uh, we have uh, not only that, we have, in, we have about $500 billion in incentives for using fossil fuels, energy intensive technologies. We talk about the dangers or the, the downside of technology, but the, the truth of the matter is we're subsidizing the energy intensive, fossil fuel intensive uh, technologies. Uh, we have a bias against work in the economy as it is now, not uh, to generate the maximum work we can. And one of the points I missed earlier about it is one of the real costs uh, which Randall has dealt with beautifully in his work that I read 20 years ago was the social cost of unemployment. We simply are not measuring the cost of crime, the cost of unemployment, the cost of health care and mental uh, illness and social uh, distraction. So we have the capacity to do this. Uh, now on the, uh, and of course, uh, the, the need on education for this. And I hope I'm not taking it because I hope we're going to come back. In fact, right after our session, the whole session is on education for entrepreneurship and employment. But I would like to get out of the big picture for a minute just to try to build the credibility of this. Uh, very briefly, 20 years ago, 20, no, 30 years ago, we did a study in India of the potential for creating full employment when nobody even thought of even studying it because it was such an absurd goal. And we quantified you would have to create 100 million jobs in 10 years. Well, 100 million jobs is not a big thing. I mean, America created 100 million jobs in a century. So what's the big deal? We only have to do it 10 times as fast. And we did not do a comprehensive study. We simply looked at the rural economy and what was the potential for raising incomes, raising productivity, and what would be the impact of that on the living standards and job creation, not only in the rural areas, but into industry services, downstream into education and everything else. And we came up with a plan that said you could create 100 million jobs in 10 years. And it looked to us as something that nobody would ever look at because this is you know, so utopian. And yet, when we presented it to the government, it went right to the prime minister and the prime minister said, we're going to do this. When the problem is, when I've gone to other countries and asked them, what is your plan for full employment? Most of the research institutes say, we never asked, we never worked on a plan. I said, why not? Nobody ever asked us <laughs> because nobody even thought it was possible. So I think we need to start with recognizing it is possible and look at the plans under which it can be created, certainly not by centralized planning and 
doing away with markets, we know that doesn't work. But by looking at all the levers we have, uh, financial levers, uh, Hank's work, another, we have a session on future, uh, on financial system change, I think tomorrow, uh, where he's going to elaborate and we have some other interesting uh, ways of bringing more money into the system to generate these jobs. Uh, that's one part, the fiscal part of it. Uh, but there are many other dimensions, the educational dimension and so forth. Gary, you're absolutely right. We come back to this question that you need, you have so many uh, ways, so many policy areas and so many actors, by the way, uh, yes. that can work uh, towards this goal of full employment. But I would like also the, what you mentioned, this 100 million jobs reminded me of uh, in every electoral process, we have governments promising so many million jobs and um, each come up with uh, targets or um, a single bullet approach like uh, just um, reduce uh, taxation and we will get there or spend only on education and skills. And we know that it's, it's about many different areas and working in tandem and in coherence. Uh, but also what you, you mentioned, and this gets me to my third question, is that do you think that uh, we are living uh, in a moment of, uh, of opportunity for these ideas to re-emerge? And um, do you see that this is actually, um, we are having the various elements and actors for a new social contract come together as we have seen this going apart and closely uh, disconnected uh, interventions and the heated policy debate on what really helps quality job creation. Do you think that this is the moment in spite of the socioeconomic uh, massive impact sufferings that COVID-19 has just exacerbated? Uh, is this a moment for optimism? And where do you see the leadership, the dynamics of change coming forward? So a wonderful question, Azita. But maybe, uh, Gary, I would start with Randall, sure. if, if you allow me. Of course. Yes. Uh, Randall, please unmute yourself. Okay, I got it, I think. Can you hear me? Yes, we Hi. hear you. Okay. Um, Yes, I think the pandemic exposed the failures of neoliberalism. Uh, <clears throat> so we lost about 40 million jobs in the US so far, but it exposed other problems, poverty, social exclusion, racism right now, right now is a huge issue in the United States. And um, I think that uh, it's also exposed the um, problems with trying to rely on the market. For example, before the pandemic, a lot of uh, people who actually supported tackling climate change essentially wanted to use market-based solutions. And now after the pandemic has hit and we've seen that we can't rely on markets to resolve that problem, there's a growing recognition that you can't rely on markets to uh, solve uh, climate change either. The national government has to play a much bigger role in um, organizing the uh, efforts we need to tackle this full range of problems. And the final point I'll, I'll make is <clears throat> that just early in March, uh, MMT, modern money theory, uh, was, uh, being attacked by all the leaders, all the central banks, uh, prime ministers, presidents, US. 
uh, around the world as crazy and dangerous. And when the end of course, the government can afford to spend trillions of dollars, uh, many trillions of dollars. And of course, it doesn't matter if the budget deficit uh, increases to 10%, 20% of GDP, because we have to tackle the pandemic. And it requires a massive effort of the national government. Climate change is an even bigger threat. And the uh, Green New Deal, no, uh, some person afford to do this. And of course, we need to uh, expand government spending and expand the role of the government. So I'm very hopeful that uh, this has all been uh, laid bare. Yes, and, and uh, um, Randall, not all our global audience are economists, so maybe you can uh, say in a few words uh, what's the basis of the modern monetary uh, theory. Randall, did you hear my question? Okay. Yes. Uh, it simply explain. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Um, okay. Uh, MMT explains how uh, the sovereign government spends in nations where the government uh, is the issuer of the currency. And just to put it very simply, uh, we often hear our uh, politicians claiming that the national government is just like a household. It uh, needs to be very careful what household would do. Well, shown is this is absolutely false for governments that issue their own currencies. They don't face financial constraints. They do face real constraints. They face resource constraints. Uh, potentially, they face labor constraints once you reach full, true full employment, uh, but they don't face financial constraints. And trying to impose financial constraints on government, uh, which we've been doing since the early 1970s, is really the, the basis for many of the problems that we face now because we've constrained government so much that they have not been able to... Um, supply us with the infrastructure that we need in the United States with universal health care, which we need. Uh, they have had to rely too much on um, the private sector and uh, the uh, non-sovereign government, state and local governments spending to try to resolve problems that really are better addressed by the uh, national government. Okay, let me then go to Hank van Arkel. Uh, where do you see the leadership coming? Where do you see this catalytic dynamics emerging? From top? No. From government? <laughs> no, <laughs> bottom up. The, the point is, of course, that um, what you see in the present uh, creation of money in the US, for example, is that uh, while banks can borrow freely and even put that money on uh, interest afterwards, States cannot and cities cannot. So uh, believe it or not, in the end, it's about power. It's about uh, who is going to earn from it and uh, who thinks I'm going to be, uh, I, I'm not going to earn as easy as I could do it. So it's about power. If you talk about power, you start bottom up because uh, in the top, there is no reason for real change. It's at the bottom where's the reason for real change. So that's why we say we organize on the, first on the level of regions where politicians are immediately, um, they have a close contact to the, to the people who vote, to the voters. Uh, and from there we can uh, reconstruct. It's even uh, in uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, it is crazy that, um, black money or money from from african-american people uh, is spent most often uh, far away 
and uh, it contributes to the accumulation of money in the speculation uh, area. We should end this. If you want to create racial uh, uh, equality and, and human equality even, if you w really want to create opportunities, you should start uh, to do something and uh, you uh, in the in the preparation you said there is no silver bullet no but there is a lead bullet there is a lead bullet and the lead bullet destroys the communities and the lead bullet is the money that goes up so we should stop because all the money in the end comes through the hands of our of us as consumers as uh, local governments if we at that moment we own a little bit of the money but we give it freely to, to make it flow uh, up and to the top. And so there we should take our power and, and do something. And uh, even create, uh, we even have the opportunity to create money on that level. So let's do it. Okay, um, Chandra, how do you see this change coming? And for, for this world community of, self-employed in fact uh, who are actually the majority of workers uh, around the world um, how do you see the change helpful change and where do you see the initiative coming or the dynamics emerging at this moment we are having the rare opportunity to improve our personal social and professional life the number of mechanical dull unhealthy jobs is going down. The number of jobs that kindle creativity and provide flexibility is going up. A possibility to shape the future of work and society is emerging. Work is being done across borders using the internet. But the centers of governance still focus only on local issues. It is time for these centers to acquire wider vision. Perhaps only a world government, one government for the entire humanity can have that world vision. So cross-border governance uh, of, of including uh, the work, uh, self-employed work and um, applying the same um, imperatives, regulatory frameworks, maybe mm. um, closing the gaps uh, in access uh, to resources, including digital resources, I think, Perhaps this is some of the things that we can uh, think uh, boldly about. Um, Gary, I have kept you for the last because I know that you are go going to bring in many uh, more issues and vision on this uh, last uh, question before we turn to the audience comments and questions. Um, what is, where do you see the, the change uh, coming and are you um, optimist, I know that you are naturally an optimist, but you never give up. But are you thinking that there is uh, objective reasons to be optimist uh, for a change? Thank you, Azita. I do. Uh, and I agree very much with what Randall said uh, about the, the signs of that. Uh, I look back actually and think that this change began in 1990 with the collapse of communism, but it was completely misread by the West. I happen to have been working in the former Soviet Union in that region at the time, and though nobody had predicted what was going to happen, and after it happened, we had people coming over from Washington and Boston and saying, you see, we told you, now we proved that capitalism has won, and they came over uh, uh, for preaching policies that we had rejected in the U.S. in the 1930s. And what we've seen is kind of, I think, as a reaction to the collapse of our alternative extreme, we've gone to another extreme the last 30 years and proven that both extremes are, are unviable, unsustainable and that it's inevitable that we come back. And the groundswell of discontent that we see, not just locally, but globally now, is a recognition of that. And I think it, it, when you're in the middle of it, it's really hard to see what's coming, just like we couldn't see the Berlin Wall falling 
by the way, one year before the Berlin Wall fell, uh, Gorbachev and Chancellor Kohl were talking privately. I know somebody who was in the room with them. He was in the last session, by the way. Uh, and they were talking about the reunification of Germany. And they, they both agreed privately that German reunification was absolutely inevitable after 30 or maybe 50 years. And within 12 months, it happened. And I think we are at a point like, I'm not predicting, I'm not a prophet, but I think the conditions are such that we see that it's becoming more and more evident to everybody that this extreme system, which is gonna be looked at as an extreme aberration like the Roaring Twenties was after we got through the thirties, uh, but when you're in it, it's hard to see it's the extreme. I think it's inevitable and it's not just, it, it, Absolutely, it's going to be a groundswell of people, and we're seeing that uh, already in many manifestations. But not only that, it's very significant that in the night that uh, in January, the World Economic Forum came out uh, with a statement that the, th that the purpose of a firm is not to maximize the profits of stakeholders. Well, did we really need to wait 50 years for somebody to challenge? Uh, Milton Friedman's thesis that the purpose of a firm is to maximize profit? The purpose of a firm is the prosperity of the society. Otherwise, why would the society have ever legalized corporations or promoted business? The economy is there to promote the welfare of the society. We get to in a crazy extreme and actually accepted it as an orthodoxy for some time, which people will never understand in future that we could have been so uh, blind uh, as we may look like uh, on the idea of uh, communism solving, uh, authoritarian communism solving all our problems. And then we, uh, we're part of the academy was invited into a group that's working with the UN in New York. It's called the Future Capital Initiative. And we had a meeting of about uh, 50 senior leaders uh, in the finance industry uh, last September, and we're working now towards uh, uh, ongoing basis. Four of the people in that room, the day before had been in a meeting with Michael Bloomberg and 25 billionaires, where Michael stood up and said, let's face it, capitalism as we know it is dead. It cannot go on this way. It simply cannot go on this way. It's alienating it, the whole rest of the society. It's accumulating so much of wealth uh, and, and at the expense of the society that it cannot be sustained. So I think that there are signs everywhere of this at the social level, at the political level and so forth. Uh, the, certainly we haven't seen this much of intensity of concern and sense of alienation. Our youth, if you look at the data on what the youth look of the future, I grew up in an America where, you know, the future was obviously going to be better and better and better. And how can you sustain a system where people, the youth, really believe that it's going to be worse and worse and worse than before? So I think the signs are all positive. I said I'm not a prophet because after the, uh, the, the end of the Cold War, there were so many positive things we could have done. Uh, we did very few of them well and un dismantled a number of them later. So I think that's where the leadership comes in. And if I could just close with one point that's uh, I think come up from your remarks and many of the remarks uh, of, of Randall certainly uh, is one of the problems we have uh, is the economic theory. It's not just the policy makers, it is the theoreticians we've still got an entrenched hold of an orthodoxy, which is more a religion, it's not a science. And I'll tell you, a year ago, I had a frightening experience because in Europe, perhaps you know, Azita, in Europe, there's a big movement among the students in graduate schools in economics demanding that their own universities start teaching heterodox policy and stop teaching as if there's only one economic philosophy or one, it's not a, a, a science, it's a philosophy, it's an orthodoxy. 
And this is growing discontent among the young people. We go out into the world and we find out this is pure theory. It has nothing to do with reality. Well, what frightened me was just at that time, I attended a conference with three senior economists from Yale who happened to be invited to Europe for summer holidays. And I was driving with one of them, a leading labor economist. Uh, and I asked him, well, how is this in the, among the students in the US? And he said, well, it frightened me because he said, we don't have that problem in the US. We all teach the same thing. And if we all teach the same thing, it sounds like what it would have been what we would have heard in Moscow in the 1970s or 1980s. And I think clearly where it's out of the box now. The problem is with the thinking. It starts with the thinking and it starts with the theory. And, and the theory reinforces the policy and the policy reinforces the institutions. And we're convinced that this is the only alternative. And now is the time to challenge it. Absolutely. And I think that, uh, as you rightly pointed out, it's not that mainstream orthodox policies have been uh, governing the policy area, but also they have permeated the education and the exposure to alternative ideas. And um, uh, the way it has been presented, it's impossible. This is a reality that we have to live with and with massive implications for distribution of wealth and for trust in the institutions, including in the institutions, uh, you know, uh, governing the labor market. Yeah. So um, I have promised, uh, we are already um, 20 minutes past six, but I have promised to take a few uh, questions and answers. I'll, there have been many, but they are mostly comments um, uh, from the audience. Uh, but I would like to bounce back um, one or two ideas that have come. One is, um, shouldn't we uh, be looking at the entire cost-benefit analysis uh, in a totally different way? And shouldn't, the, the question is about corporations, but the value that we, we give to, uh, uh, to maintaining machinery or adopting technology, investing in new technologies, instead of investing in, in the rights, in health and well-being of the workforce. Um, there has been also other echoes and papers and new ideas on looking totally the, the different way uh, into the question of uh, the debt crisis that uh, Randall mentioned uh, in relation to the social debt crisis. Uh, to the economic and financial debt crisis. Um, uh, it has also come about to, if we look at the economic uh, uh, terminology of looking at externalities as internalities and turning back the accountability to, uh, to the, those who are uh, running the production uh, chains and, and, and systems. So there are various ways, but it's this whole notion of cost and benefit analysis that is put at the center. And I would like to invite uh, Randall uh, first and, and the other panelists afterwards to reflect on this question uh, as well as add any concluding remarks briefly that you want to say uh, before we close the, the session. So Randall Ray, please unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. <clears throat> All right, uh, so I'll uh, answer that question uh, with respect to unemployment. Economists, you hear them say all the time, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So economists are famous for saying this. Nothing could be more wrong than that. <laughs> it's, it's the stupidest statement an economist could ever make. If you take somebody who wants work, they want to do something useful, they want to produce something that's going to benefit society, you take someone like that and put them to work 
it of course is a free lunch. You are uh, employing someone who's not uh, otherwise employed and you're letting them do something productive. That is a free lunch. We have free lunches all over the place. Uh, we have a cornucopia of free lunches and we are not making use of those. And the reason that we don't do it, well, there are two reasons, and both of these I've already mentioned. First, there's this belief that uh, the government has to be very careful and balance its budget. And the second is there's the belief that keeping a lot of people unemployed is really good for the economy because it keeps inflation down. Now, both of these are false. Uh, the government cannot run out of its own money and uh, it, what it faces is a resource constraint. But if you have unemployed people, the best thing to do is to put them to work. And you can design a full employment program that is not inflationary. The job guarantee uh, program is, uh, well, the one that I know of, maybe someone can come up with another one. But the job guarantee program only employs people who can't otherwise find a job. And by definition, that is not going to be inflationary. You muted yourself. Have you finished? Uh, yeah, I, I'll stop with that statement. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Hank, uh, what would you say to this? You've already, it goes in the same direction that you have been introducing the discussion in the sense that cost and benefit, whose cost, whose benefit analysis uh, that applies also in your um, innovative way of looking at uh, money circulation. Uh, if you don't mind, Gary inspired me to go from the other side. Um, what we see is that we have a, a structure, a system uh, that creates this stuff. So it, we have rules of the game. One major rule is the limited uh, liability. So people who earn money can lose their shares, but they can never be, uh, become liable for the results. So what if people who would have invested in cigarettes now we'll have to pay the price of all the the charities and the the hospitals what if i think uh, what we need to bring back is that the entrepreneur needs to be responsible for his deeds the entrepreneur not somebody uh, who owns the company the entrepreneur should should be the responsible and the others should not have a say anyway so uh, i think as long as we don't target on that level on the structure, uh, we have a problem because then you have a group of people who hire other people to make their money grow. Um, and those other people will take risks, but the risks are on the side of society and the profit is on their side. So that's always a smart way to deal with it. Okay, and Chandra? Uh, I think, uh, I think cost benefit analysis should not be uh, done merely in terms of dollars. Please unmute uh, yourself. Do you hear yeah. me? Yes. Yes, yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, I think cost benefit analysis should not be done merely in terms of dollars or pounds or euros. We should develop standards to measure uh, cost benefit in terms of human progress. That's what I think. I don't know how it can be done, but it should be done. There are very many ways that this has been done. And, and I'm sure there are other, um, you know, the, the whole notion of well-being or the, the notion of, of social cost or social investment. Uh, the financial debt crisis to, uh, in comparison to the social debt crisis. So I think there are various ways of looking at this cost-benefit analysis, but from a, a more human-centered uh, vision of the cost-benefit analysis. Um, I would uh, like to end this conversation with uh, Gary's uh, 
uh, who has already uh, injected many comments and ideas, but on this notion of cost and benefit analysis, what do you think? And your remark about the World Economic Forum statement uh, about the, um, the final goal of firms or enterprises also reminded me that the next session um, of the World Economic Forum have been put under the um, title of resetting uh, capital. So uh, I would like to end with that note. Do we, are we living a moment when there are many ideas around how we can have a more humane capitalism? Uh, how do we mend these excessive inequalities that have been rising? Or are we thinking, and there is still opportunity for thinking of different paradigms? Uh, Gary, your last remarks. Please unmute yourself. Wonderful questions. You. Uh, I am uh, by profession a, a business consultant and I have studied companies that have been successful not only in short term but over decades and even over a century. And I have found the formula uh, has always been that the companies that are really able to sustain success over a long period of time are those that make the maximum contribution to the growth of the society and the development of the society, regardless of what uh, business says about them. They are in tune with social needs and aspirations, and they become an instrument for the, the fulfillment of those needs. Uh, and I believe that's still true, not the short-term speculative gains of what happens for a year or two uh, in this crazy market. I'd like to go back to a point that Pink made about limited liability. Because you know, in the 19th century and earlier, when you trace it back to its origin, limited liability was a very rare privilege that was given. It wasn't given to businesses. It was given to organizations that were serving the society and meeting a need. Limited liability is a privilege in order to do something for the sake of the community. And we have just turned it upside down to limited liability is a privilege to mint money at the expense of the community, the expense of the environment, the expense of the society. It's a perversion of the original principle in law. Uh, patent law, the economist did a wonderful study a few years ago. Economists did this, by the way, and said, the rationale for patent law and giving extended patent protection was to extend innovation and investment in innovation. And their own research showed that it's having exactly the opposite effect. It's removing the necessity for companies to invest in innovation because they ride on their past uh, uh, investments for longer and longer, and then they buy up young companies uh, uh, instead of doing the innovation themselves. Uh, so I think that at every point uh, we've got, we're taxing the most valuable thing we have, which is the human being. We're taxing from per payroll as if it's, it's a penalty to put people to work when by putting people to work, I think we lost the, we lost you for a second. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. We'll just wait a minute. We have been receiving a number of valuable chat messages, comments, and questions. All these will be recorded and so that we don't lose all the valuable information that we just received. Yes, we are hearing our okay. admin facilitator uh, while we were waiting for Gary to reconnect again. Gary, uh, please continue. Um, Sorry, I didn't realize where I, I was talking to myself for a minute or two, I guess. <laughs> I didn't realize 
got cut until then I saw you were frozen. Uh, I was talking about the patent law and then I said, you know, we're taxing our most valuable resource and trying to discourage it from being utilized. That's the human resource. We incentivize and give depreciation allowances and all kinds of incentives to use technology to eliminate people, which dis and subsidizing the fossil fuels to encourage us from ignoring the human resource, which not only is the, mo is the only creative resource on earth, it's not, but it's also the thing that we want to sustain through the work. It just doesn't make sense that we've got a perverse system that penalizes the use of people and incentivizes uh, eliminating people. Uh, and, but I'd like to close with this comment, which refers back to something that you said, Azita, and also I think it was Hank. Uh, all the evidence shows that society is most successful when it distributes the benefits or the power in society to the widest number, most equitably. The whole principle of democracy, the reason we think we outgrew uh, monarchy, let alone authoritarianism was, is because by distributing social power, in this case, political power, to the maximum, we got the most gains. The society became the most viable. People became the most productive, uh, motivated, uh, and all. That's the philosophy for giving away ed education to everybody, universal education, because the society benefits when everybody has it, not when we keep it to a few. The idea of universal health care is we see now <laughs> if, if people are, uh, if, if illness is there in one part of the population, it endangers the whole world population. And I think the same thing is true uh, about income distribution. The society is most sustainable, sound, secure, viable, free, only when we ensure a system that provides remunerative and economic security to everybody. It's for the benefit of everybody that we do this, not just for the benefit of those who don't have jobs now. Thank you very much, Gary. I can take your last words as a closing, but let me just say that, in fact, we have just started our conversation, and I, I hope that when we will have uh, a lot of opportunity to hammer out these very many issues that have come up. Uh, we will, um, uh, we, we, we didn't uh, focus as much as we could have on the return of the role of the state but what type of state and uh, what level of you know uh, accountability decentralization um, at local levels local participatory democracy there are lots of issues that connect uh, human socioeconomic security with political and military security there are lots of issues that um, in fact, um, bear upon the value of work and uh, the value of work, not just as a mechanism of social and economic distribution, but uh, a, a, a value of work, uh, including all types of work, voluntary work, um, uh, remunerative work, uh, within this, the nature of human work vis-a-vis -vis all those artificial intelligence, who is commanding who, and how can we uh, harness the technology in a way that they do not reproduce the levels of discrimination or the biases that are currently uh, pervading the, 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 the uh, labor relations. Um, so, how can we look at different levels of uh, insecurity and the connections between a full employment agenda and connections between social protection is providing uh, uh, basic uh, minimum income to everybody is the solution or should it go through the work or the, it's a combination of both as you, you, you just mentioned. We have been uh, only 
uh, scratching the surface on two important issues, but that's, I know that um, you have plenty of discussion coming up in education and skills. It's utmost important and education and skills in this digital age. Uh, how this nature is a thing, and as you rightly put, and on youth, youth expectations, youth transitions, as you have rightly pointed to, but we have discussed that in so many various international fora, is that the current generation of young people, while better educated than ever in the history everywhere, uh, have a lot more difficulty in accessing labor markets and they do not see any more, uh, including in, uh, in, in, in economies that have been growing, uh, the, to have the rightful place in access to economic opportunities, in access to work, in access to the political space and creative space. So I think that these, you have panels foreseen, actually one has already started in parallel to this one, but there are also tomorrow the whole day, uh, future, uh, I mean, youth, future generation uh, perspectives into from many different angles. So I would just like to, um, invite our global ad audience uh, to give a digital applause, if, if I may, to our uh, uh, four panelists. I thank them very much, very warmly for their time and for injecting so many uh, out of the box ideas into this conversation. Obviously it's a conversation that will have to be continued. We will need to get more perspectives, perspectives from enterprises, from corporations, from small, medium, micro, uh, individual entrepreneurs. We need the perspectives, more varied perspectives from the global south. Uh, but I think that it is a very good start of a conversation to be continued. Thank you all and see you in the next sessions. Azita, thank you to, and thanks all the panelists, but thank you for wonderful moderation. That was fabulous. Thank you. And as our admin assistant has already uh, uh, informed you that your comments, your questions, and the entire session will be available later uh, uh, in uh, uh, various forms. Thank you. Thank you. And goodbye. Mani, can you show us what's the next session uh, today? You can show that. We have added that in chat, but yes, we will show that also. Oh, the previous slide, please. Uh, please, previous slide so we can see. Because it is on education, entrepreneurship, and employment, I believe, no? Yes. Just. It's in the chat window. And the link is in the chat window. This is the answer. Thank you, Jim. Yes.